Praise the Lord. Let me quickly take a survey of those of us that are here so as to help our discussions. I hope in a few minutes the paper we are going to share will soon arrive. Share will soon arrive. And we are hoping that each one of us must have a copy. Whether we are able to finish or we are not, you will be able to go home and sit down again and uh, look more closely into the issues that we shall be raising. Can I see those among us who are pastors or leaders of some local churches? Are there pastors here? Okay. Praise the Lord. Welcome. What of church elders? Church elders or elders of fellowships and ministries? You are an ESCO member of your fellowship? Okay. Praise the Lord. Do we have women fellowship leaders? You are leading a particular fellowship? And it's a woman fellowship. Okay, it's good. What of Sunday school teachers? Sunday school teachers. It's good. Uh, leaders of singing teams. Do we have any singer here? Oh, thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Is anybody among us who is having a call of God in his life and is about to move into ministry? We are not here. Oh, one person. Praise the Lord. Why did you raise up your hand? Why? He's just coming in and he's raising up his hand. <laughs> That's good. Uh, we are going to be looking at effective ministration. Effective ministration. And um, what we mean by effective ministration it will entail so much. That's why I'm afraid we may not be able to finish. And that's why I intend that God will help us to have this paper on our hands. We're going to be looking at issues like what is effective ministration? How can we minister and there will be a definite, a discernible, a measurable, permanent effect in the lives of people? Can we come to a position where when we minister by the grace of God, lives are permanently changed, not for two weeks, such that whatever we were able to do for God, there's a definite measurable impact. So we will be this morning looking at what is effective ministration. And um, we'll be defining it not in terms of giving a talk, Praise the Lord. We are going to be looking at ministration as a life service. And this life service, how does it, how can we get into affecting men? So we will define what an effective ministration is. We are going to define it from contemporary issues, from scriptures. We are going to take examples of men that God had affected and who had affected their own land for God. Then we are going to look at what are the ingredients of effective ministration. What are the ingredients? And uh, under the ingredients, we'll be looking at personal anointing. We'll be looking at the minister's lifestyle. We'll be looking at the role of the word of God in an effective ministration. We will be looking at how do I get revelation from the word of God that could change another life? How could I leave the realm of ordinary sermon unto speaking to the hearts of men in such a way that uh, years may pass, those lives are still standing. We'll be, we'll be looking at life transfer, the transfer of life. And we'll be looking at um, the spiritual leadership of a minister. We'll be also looking at hindrances unto effective ministration. What are the hindrances? Uh, issues like professionalism, issues like unequal yoking in ministry, issues like um, money in ministry, and all those. There are issues we are trying to raise. I know that three hours, four hours is never enough.
to handle those matters. But we are going to see how God will lead us. I suppose if wherever we reach, if we conclude that we want to come again on this issue, we will decide, looking at the time we may have. Praise the Lord. So which means I'm not rushing in terms of finishing a whole thing uh, this afternoon. But wherever we stop, if we think it is necessary for us to come again, and if there's a time we could create for it within this period of time we have, we will see what to do. Now, so let me get into the introduction. I hope you understand what we are looking at now. Praise the Lord. So let me ask you, what are we here for? Yes? I'm asking you a question. Yes? Your what? Output. Yes, sir. Okay. Praise the Lord. Why did we need to emphasize that a lesson without a behavioral objective is a failure? At the end of this series of lessons, we are expecting a measurable, a discernible change in your ministry. And if you are not looking for that kind of measurable experience, then there is no need to come into this meeting. So when we study, we are studying in order to arrive at a measurable change in our work for the Lord Jesus. So whatsoever we study, don't forget we are only studying as a means to an end. Is that okay now? We are not here to analyze others. We are not here for Bible study per se. We are studying the Bible in order to have a spiritual experience. And the measure of whatever has happened to us can never be said in this room. We won't be interested. It won't be correct for you to stand up and say, Brother, I thank God for that sharing. It really worked. No. If it worked, we will see it. Are you understanding that now? And be expecting that one of these days, God will send you out. And where you stand there, the glory of God will come. That will be the only evidence that you have attended this meeting. So while we are studying, we need to pray. Because we are, we are trying to do what no man can do for us. We are trying to see how can I be effective in the work to which I believe God has called me to. Some of us are full-time preachers here. And years are rolling us by. And sincerely speaking, except we don't want to probe our minds, sincerely speaking, some of us may be asking questions. Is this how I will end my life? Is this actually what the best that I can be for God? Those are the kind of questions. But we are trusting that God himself will visit us. Not just answer questions. Give us a local, measurable evidence of his hand on our lives. Praise the Lord. Okay? As men who seek to affect other men for God and prepare them for eternity, we are in constant conflict with the devil, the arch enemy of God and his kingdom on all sides, ranging from internal, personal conflicts, even to the external onslaught, just to maim and incapacitate us in the ministry that God has called us, or at least to make the ministry ineffective and inconsequential. Now, one thing I've said from that little introduction is the fact that what we are looking for in terms of being effective, is something that somebody doesn't want us to have. Who doesn't want us to be effective? The devil. It is never in the plan of the devil to see the ministry of the word of God effective. And if he sees a man, a brother, a sister, who is bent in becoming effective for God, the devil must do all that lies within his power to make sure he frustrates him, not only frustrates him, if he can amputate him, if he can make him maim and make him void and empty 
he will like to do that. And if he cannot do that, he will just like that man to be all over the place without any tangible result. The devil, there are two stages. There is a stage in which he fights you never to see the work of ministry as something to get involved in. But if he fails and you say, I will serve God, I will do something for God, I will preach the gospel, he said, no problem. You will preach the gospel, no problem. You will organize meetings, no problem. He now desires and seeks every avenue to do what? To make sure you don't arrive at anything. He loves that much money should be spent, much things. What can we do? Suggest what can we do? What can we do to finish this man? How can we cut him short? Are the papers here now? Daddy, are they here? Bring it quickly. Not stapled yet. Okay, so do that in one minute. Let someone be shining page one, another one shining page two. Very quickly. Very, very quickly, brother. You are going to get two sheets. They are not stapled, so when you get home, you step with it. First paragraph. And I was telling you that the enemy seeks always to raise conflicts, internal, personal conflicts, just to divert attention from reality to the external attack. And his aim is only one. The Bible said the thief commits not, but to do what? To steal, to kill, and to do what? To destroy. That's why he comes. If the devil ever came around any man, even if he's greeting you or smiling with you or doing anything, he has only one purpose. And what was that purpose? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is his job. That is his job. I was just telling you of John the Baptist. Imagine how suddenly the enemy said, what can we do to cut him short? And you remember he was arrested and put into prison? And now they organized a birthday party one day for the king, Herod. And there was a dancing competition. Do you remember that competition? And as they were dancing and dancing, there was this small girl who danced. And the girl won the prize. And the king stood up and said, you have won. You are the declared winner. And you're going to have anything that you can ask from the beginning of my kingdom to half of it. Anything you want up to half of the kingdom, you will have it. And one expects that that girl should be excited, isn't it? She was. She was excited. But she was also a very wise girl. She knows that she won't be able to make the right choice. When you suddenly succeed and you are not planning for that success, you may waste it, isn't it? So the girl quickly went to her sponsors because somebody sponsored her. She went home quickly and said, Mommy, something happened. We have won. 
And the king said, I shall ask anything that I want. Mommy, what shall I ask? And the mother looked up and down and said, Hmm, it's okay. And she went inside and went and got a, a calabash with a cover and brought it out. The girl was still in suspense. Say, Mommy, everybody is waiting on the stage. Oh. They are waiting now because I'm just supposed to come and request anything they will give me. Mommy said, cool down. Naim, I'm telling you what we want. And the mama must have said, we don't want millions of naira. We don't want positions in government. We don't want, we don't want political appointments. We don't want houses. We don't want lands. All we want, all we want, all that we want is the head of John, John the Baptist. So take this calabash. When you go back, just tell them, we don't want Naira. We don't want many houses. We don't want positions. All we want, all we want is the head, the head of John the Baptist. You get the money. What? Are we going to do with the head of John the Baptist's head? We don't want millions of naira. We don't want plenty of houses. We don't want positions. All we want, all we want is the head, the head of John the Baptist. When the devil sees a man of correct anointing, he can pay half of his kingdom for his head. Some of you don't know how much value the devil places on a man that possesses a true anointing. When Samson grew up with anointing, how about Emergency meeting was called in the whole country of Philistines. All the five senatorial districts of the land of Philistines. They gathered together. All the lords of Philistines. A top management meeting was called. What shall we do to finish Samson? Another one said, let us go and fight him. They said, look, that man, I was there. I only escaped by chance. When he took the jawbone of an ass and he slaughtered 1,000 of our soldiers, fighting will not deal with him. To go and confront him and say we are fighting, we will just waste our time. We don't know the source of his power. Let us organize, reduce and joke. Let us invite him as the guest of honor. You remember the reduce and joke they organized? And Mr. Samson was invited as the chief guest of honor. What were they arranging for? Eh? They were arranging for his head. They sponsored a girl. And I tell you, if the devil notices that God wants to make you something, he will sponsor somebody. He will invest in making sure you don't arrive. Are you planning to be a man of God? Are you planning to be somebody for God? Then you may as well know this. That somebody. Somebody. Is looking for your head. Are we planning that God should use us to turn our generation alive for God? Yes. Then you must as well recognize. That you are entering into a dangerous conflict. And I remember that reduce and joke. And as it went, somebody was able to get the secret of that reduce and joke from Samson. You don't know. That the Philistines said, that is just to test whether this man 
If we sponsor a girl, the girl can get the secret from his mouth. Since it happened with ordinary riddles and joke. Maybe if we get another girl, he will be able to release the secret of his power. There are so many ministers that they are not alarmed that their lives are beginning to be exposed to the devil because it was ordinary riddles and joke. When that first girl was able to understand the secret of uh, the honey in a dead uh, carcass, They said, if that girl can get us that little secret, we are likely to succeed to get the bigger secret by sponsoring another girl. Do you remember? You remember? One day they noticed that Mr. Samson showed a little interest in Delilah. The five lords of Philistines just quickly called that girl and said, look, we noticed that Samson is trying to make some advances towards you. She said, well, but I don't like him. Ah, they said, no. No, please. You must like him. All of us, we are behind you. You will marry him. And we are going to pay you for marrying him. Every senatorial district in this country, we are going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver. I don't know how much that will be in current foreign exchange, but it must have been several hundreds and thousands of dollars. And five of them were going to give her 5,500 pieces of silver. That could have been running towards some millions. Just marry him and get the secret of his power. That's all we want. Be a patriot. So the next time when Samson came, you know what Delilah did? Instead of running and saying, no, I don't want. Oh, she quickly fried chicken and made pepper soup and created a good atmosphere. And a man that was born to be great for God relaxed and started eating pepper soup. They were ranging from one issue to another. I imagine occasionally Delilah will do as if she's just laughing. She will just laugh, 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 blah, blah, on the chest of Samson. I imagine occasionally the girl will just arrange her two eyelids and waiting for the eye of Mr. Samson. And as the eye will meet, she will turn it inside, sending a kind of sensation into the emotional base of this man of God. Nothing was said that day. Samson went home, he couldn't sleep. He told the mommy, Mommy, I've got somebody to marry from the valley of Sorek. Why will you marry not from the Mount of Ephraim? He said, no, 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 no. I want to marry from the valley of Sorek. I have seen somebody there and it suits me well. It agrees with my mind, agrees with my emotion. That's how he got married to Delilah. Watch out. Maybe somebody is sponsoring something for your life. So while we are studying this effective ministration, I don't want to assume that there is nobody who is walking up and down. Who is offended that God's people are beginning to be serious about their destination. That God's people are beginning to take the will of God for their lives? Seriously. I don't want to assume that there's nobody like that. There is. And how Samson, a great man of God. One of these days, Delilah just came and positioned Samson on her laps. I must have been using her hand to rock that man from, from neck, you know, through. And said, do you really love me? And the boy said, oh, who else do I love in this world apart from you? I love you so much. Until the girl reached out for the seven locks of anointing. She used her hand to count it, to feel it, to get where they are located, to locate. When she got it, the man said, In fact, if I was shaked, my power would leave me. He said, Really? 
let's make an experiment. There are many, many servants of God that have made experiments, costly experiments, with the grace of God on their lives. Costly experiments. Look, when we were in school doing chemistry, doing physics, we normally do experiments. But we do experiments with chemicals that are not too costly. You don't do experiments with irretrievable materials. When a material is very scarce and costly, they don't give it to novice. That time they will just provide what we call a model. Then the teacher will stand up and say, it used to move like this, it used to move like that, a model. Bring the real thing, let's try this, sorry, we don't, we don't do that, it's an explosive. Even men of this world, they know how not to play with costly materials. They don't make experiments. But ministers and children of God, they carelessly make experiments, irretrievable experiments with their own lives. They get say, let's make experiments. Let's cut it and see. They cut number one. They cut number two. They cut number three. They cut number four. They cut number five. They cut number six. They cut number seven. And Delilah quickly went to her sponsors. Come. I got him. That's how something they pluck his two eyes. He became a useless man. So as we are talking about effective ministration today, I want you to note that we are only preparing ourselves. If we notice that others fail, how am I not going to fail? That's the issue. We are not here to criticize somebody. Get that clear. We are here to learn for our lives such that if we have opportunity to be anything for God, we will be effective. Hallelujah. If we analyze somebody who fell, either in scriptures or in contemporary history, we are not doing that because we are in position to be analysts. But we must look well. Our people have a proverb that said, he who knows how to watch others on stage when they are dancing, when it is his own turn to dance, he will know how to move according to the, to the music. All we are doing is God give us opportunity to stand apart. Let's review issues before we launch back into ministry. Let's not just go there headlong, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what to look for in our lives as individuals. That's why we are studying this. And I want you to keep praying because I'm taking all this time to show you that wheresoever there is no focus, even in our study, we cannot expect any result. So my prayer personally is, Lord, show me how to be effective, how to escape the perils, the hindrances that beset us on our path unto serving God effectively. We want to look intently into the tiny, minute, almost silent ingredients that make for a powerful and an effective ministration among men. Praise the Lord. Look at the last paragraph there. It says, Many men of considerable anointing and grace have become obsolete and irrelevant just in few years of ministry. Why? Are you understanding me? These are questions we are setting our mind to answer. Why? Men of considerable grace and anointing, men that when they spoke, they affected men. Why were they so brief in ministry? Why did they quickly move into oblivion? What happened to them? How did they miss it? How did the great men of our time, how did they fall? What was the secret? Listen, it was not a correct approach for you to sit down there criticizing me and say, they missed it, this and that. When it is your time, when it is your turn to do something, you are not likely to do better. I do remember that years ago, we sat under people. When they come to teach us, oh, they tell us how pastors have missed it, how we must come out from among them. That was the beginning of many of us coming out. I'm not too old. 
these years are so brief that I begin to imagine those men that told us to come out, the atrocities they are performing now is worse than the ones they said we should come out from. Why? What happens? And if they were caught up, even in what they themselves preached to us about, could somebody be quietly behind doing this kind of work? And if we're expecting a revival, why don't we gather our lives together and say, Lord, tell us now, before the glory burst forth, tell me now, how must I gather my life so that I will not fall where men fell? Maybe their own punishment will be very, very small because maybe they didn't have examples. But what do you say about those of us? We have men. We have bibliographies and biographies to read. We have the Bible. And we have exhibits of men that dot our road. Who are there and say, when I used to be great. When my life used to be good. When the power of God was with me. What happened? That they missed it. That's why we are here in a, a very fearful meeting. It's not a meeting where anybody can talk anyhow. We are dealing with issues. And if we are not willing to respond, there's no need to pretend that we want to know anything across these issues. Several works that began to be great stopped short of a breakthrough in our land, such that revival still eludes us despite all our toilings. We want to discuss as practically as we can, opening up to the Holy Ghost for divine illumination such that we might place our feet and spurs on the path of wisdom, the elders and patriarchs trot. Amen. Did you get our general basis? We're now going to discuss it. We're going to be discussing together as we go through scriptures. I'm not sure we can do it verse by verse. Otherwise, we won't finish here in two weeks. But we will be picking a few things as we discuss. If you have questions, you will have opportunity to ask. If you have an insight that is coming to your heart as we discuss, as we learn, as we pray, you will have opportunity to raise it. We are here to reason together and to pray together. At the end of this meeting, we are going to pray for one another. We are going to say, God, since this brother has shown interest in wanting to be effective, may he not die like that. May he not just fall like that. May your grace be made abundantly sufficient for each of our lives in Jesus' name. So let's go to section A of our discussion. Effective ministration. What is it? Have you seen that section A? Eh? Effective ministration. What is it? What is it? What will you consider an effective ministration to me? What will you consider an effective ministration to me? Praise the Lord. Can we look at 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9? First Corinthians 16 verse 9. Can somebody quietly, I mean quickly read for us? First Corinthians 16 verse 9. Can we read it again from NIV? Good news. Is there good news there? We're all King James people. To do what? Okay. Praise the Lord. Let's look at that scripture closely. From that scripture, can I ask you, what will you consider as an effective ministration? We all have opportunity to talk. Verse 9.
what will you call an effective ministration from that verse 9? Yes. Ability to succeed. What do you mean by succeed? Which ministration? I think you came late. We said our ministration is not a talk. It's not that I gave a talk or we carried out the crusade. That was not ministration in the light we are looking at it, sir. One that raises opposition. One that raises opposition, sir. Not just an open door, but to utilize. I wish you were going to be talking of the word effectual. Okay, you can sit down. Yes, let's have him. That brings desirable results. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, brother. No sister is talking yet. Okay. It produces lasting fruits and results. Yes, brother. Okay, now let's. Okay, you want to say something, brother? So, for administration to be effective, it has to create a displacement, it has to cause a turning around from the direction that men are going before to another direction has been dictated through that ministration. Now, if we check the good news, as our brother read for us, there's a real opportunity here. That's the open door. Is that okay? But we're not talking of open door alone. He said, for great and worthwhile work. A worthwhile work. What will you call a worthwhile work? Sister, yes? Uh, okay. What will you say something is worthwhile? Yes. It's necessary. Yes, brother and sister. Worthwhile. Yes. You want to say something? Okay. A work that justifies the input. I want you to think, those of you that have been in ministry, those of you that have organized programs, those of you that have organized crusades, and you have attended crusades in this town, where millions of naira were used to put the meeting together. Either by your local ministry, or by your local church, or by a group of churches. Can you look back very quickly, personally into your life? Can you look for results that you got? if it justifies the effort 
the publicity, the monetary financial commitment, and the time allotted to it. Will we say a crusade that mobilized the whole of Kaduna and the whole of its environs for a week? Everybody was there. What we say is an effective ministration. And yet, after one week, or after two months, or after three months, there is no considerable increase in the kingdom of God. What we call that an effective ministration. Is it a worthwhile work? A work that was done with large input, but with little or no output. And even when these outputs are there, they are not effectual. When our brother was raising the issue of effectual, I thought he was going to go on to say, because when you use the word effectual, I think effect is the root. Is that okay? And effect means it's coming from affect. A work that does what? That affects. And not just that it affects, it goes on to continue to affect. It's like they said, this thing has, has happened. I'm sorry, I can't go back on it again. An effectual worthwhile work. So all we are saying is that there's something. Effectual worthwhile work. So all we are saying is that there's something like that. Praise the Lord. That there's something like that that God may want to call us on. Of course, somebody says it's a walk that raises dust from hell. I don't know whether you are interested in that definition. Eh? A walk that necessarily alarms and alerts the forces of hell. I'm not talking of a deliberate attempt to make noise. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking of a deliberate attempt to draw attention to yourself. I'm talking of something that happens, no matter how quiet. The head cannot keep quiet. I wish we can check that out very quickly. Now, you will see Paul was talking about that particular place and he was talking about what happened at Ephesus. What happened at Ephesus. I want us to go back very, very quickly, just quickly, and see what we mean. When we say it's an effective work, an effectual work, what does it mean? Let's go to where it actually took place. Acts chapter 19. Hallelujah. That was the place that he was reporting at Ephesus. We want to see the work. I want us to read from verse 8. Who is a fast reader? Who will be reading for us? Let's wait. Is Asia one town? What is it? It's a province. And what do you first of all notice about that ministry in verse 10? Eh? Eh, for the space of two years. Then what happened? Eh? 
so that all they who dwell in Asia for the space of two years. How many years have we started this church? Who is a member of this church? When was this church founded? Eh? 88. That's good. Who is a pastor here? Not the pastor of this church. Where are pastors? Some pastors raise up their hands at that time. Where are the pastors? Pastor. Praise the Lord. When did you get into ministry? Pastor. Am I too particular? Sorry, we are together. Yes. Eighty-five. Thank you, sir. That's about seven years ago. Definitely there may be some of us who have been in ministry for ten years. Isn't it? There are people that will say, I was in ministry for the past 20 years. I just want to draw our attention, first of all. And by the time we were talking about this, what was the... What were the technological gadgets that were used so that Asia had the word of God in two years. Please, listen, let's relax. We are here wanting to discover the true position of our lives. Are you understanding? If you don't want to face reality, there's no need to be in this meeting. I don't think anybody is threatened. And I don't think anybody benefits when nothing actually is happening and we say it is happening we are trying to discover what an effective ministration will be from our elders who have gone ahead that's why we are taking questions in two years this man said asia had the word of the lord how did he do it if you go to chapter 20 you may get a clue. 2020. Who reads 2020 for us? Acts 2020. Okay. How did he do it that the whole Asia had the word of the Lord in two years? Publicly and house to house. Such that by the time he was leaving Ephesus, what did he say? Can you help us see what he said in verse 26? Acts 20, 26. Verse 27. How many men among us here today? Don't talk of the whole Asia. Talk about your Sunday school class. You are a Sunday school teacher. Let's imagine that you have about 50 people in your class. Will you sincerely, since the past three years that you've been teaching that class, Will you be able to say in verse 26 that I, be, I take you to record today that I am pure from the blood of all of you, 50 of you? I want you to look deep now. All the sisters that are in your sister's fellowship, can you publicly be able to stand and say, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you 
But I have shown you and I have taught you publicly in fellowship and from house to house. Those of you that are choir members and choir master, your choir is no more than 50, I suppose. Are you able, sincerely before the Lord Jesus, able to declare that I am free from the blood of every member of my choir? And those of you that are pastors over a church, I don't know whether your church membership is about 2,000. As the pastor. Maybe you have been a pastor over that local church, which I don't know whether it's up to 2,000 yet, for the past several years. Will you be able to stand up? What are we doing? We are trying to define what an effective ministration will look like. And before you go about saying, I am a minister, I am a minister, I am a minister. Somebody said, such that in the space of two years, all that dwell in Asia, and I don't think they were exaggerating. Praise the Lord. That all those who dwell in Asia, they've heard the word in the space of two years. I just want to drop that question for you to chew it as we go on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's go back to chapter 19. We are still trying to see what an effective ministration will be. When the brother said, an open door and a great effectual door was open to me, though there are many, many adversaries. We are trying to understand what could it mean. Can I have another sister now? Yes. Not now, please. Verse 11. Oh, then, sister, you have to sit down. You don't have the voice. Pray God to release your voice. We are reading on. We are reading on. Okay, wait. Let me just read from here so that I can draw your attention to what I want you to note as our time is a bit short. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Have you noted that? Eh? Okay. Then Certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one scaver, a Jew and chief of the priests, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus. I know. And Paul, I know. But who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the, all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on all them and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Let's stop there. Meanwhile, we're still going to study. Now, let's leave verse 11 and 12. Meanwhile, because it looks very clear, isn't it? Eh? Eh? That it looks clear as if there is a manifestation of grace 
and an anointing and power on the life of Brother Paul. Such that notable special miracles were wrought by his hands and people were healed even from handkerchiefs and aprons that were coming out of his body. And evil spirits were cast out like that. Praise the Lord. Why did I say we should put that on one side of our mind? We may be tempted to conclude that yes, it is miracles that made him effective. But just along that line, that is one way of effectiveness. Amen? The Bible also told us about John the Baptist. Who did how many miracles? Who wrought not one miracle? And yet, all Judea, all Jerusalem, all Idumea did what? They came to him. I don't know whether you get what I'm saying. Okay. So we are trying to get what is the true definition of an effective ministration. And we don't want to just end it up and say it's because there are no miracles. Uh -uh. Maybe even if there were miracles, it may not result in an effective ministration. Amen. So that's why we want to keep that aside. Meanwhile, so that when we begin to pray again, if we have understood, we will be asking the Lord, why wouldn't you do what you did with Paul in our own lives? Or has God changed? What was the secret of these men that they were able to affect Asia in two years? Such that after many years, Ephesus is still standing. That's why we have the book of Ephesians. I don't know whether you're understanding me. But there are places we went, had meetings, had crusades, and just even after about one year, we cannot write to that place and get any response because there's nothing there. But we thank God. Ephesus still remains up to today. Many, many years after, Jesus still needed to send a letter to the Ephesians why? Because they are still there. Hallelujah. That's the kind of what we are talking about. But let's go on. The Bible said, some vagabond Jews, exorcists. What's the meaning of exorcists? Please give us a simpler word quickly. Eh? Magicians? They are jaw evil spirits. Is there any simpler version? Is there a living Bible that can help us quickly? Which doctors? Which doctors? I thought you are reading something, brother. Oh, you are not reading? Okay. You are not with us. Just sit down yet. Learn to go with this class. Because we won't be able to be carrying you along. Yes? What is an exorcist? Yes? A diviner. Eh? He divines. To divide. Dividing what? Ah, that's not it now. Good news. Can you read that verse in good news? Since we are not getting the meaning now. Yes. They do what? They travel around and do what? They go around to drive out evil spirits. Is that okay now? It was their profession. What I want you to look at is not all those things. Though. We are trying to see what was the effect of the ministry of Paul even on this class of professional evil drivers. People who drive out demons as a profession. Do you know that we have some of them around Kaduna now? Eh? They are the specialists in killing the mad people. They tie down the madman and either begin to beat him and beat him. Have you been to some of these um, uh, Ladura churches? And they, when they get somebody mad, they tie him down, they beat him. They give you thorough beating in the morning. As though those demons will start going out. 
Now, what do you think is the effect of the ministry of Brother Paul on those people? It's time for you to share now. What will you think is his ministry? What is the effect of Paul's ministry on these professionals? Yes? Eh? How? Read from the Bible and tell us, sir. They think that what Paul is doing is a better and a shorter method of getting their job done. I don't know whether you get that. Something told them that, what? This thing that we used to do and beat people and shake people and for 24 hours it don't go. And this man just comes. And he uses the name of Jesus to get the job done. Even though we don't want to be a follower of his Jesus, we love to use his method. Are you understanding the effect, effectiveness we are talking about now? A ministration that people cannot ignore. They felt that even though we are not inside, we would like to be identified with it. What else do you notice again before we conclude that statement? Has anybody noticed something again? The ministration of Brother Paul, what is the effect on those professionals? Eh? It exposed their falsehood. Yes, brother. Oh, they discovered that they are not qualified for that method. Yes. They also started. They become. They become an itinerant exorcist because it's bothering them. The way brother Paul is moving from house to house. And people are no more having a need to bring their demonized people to them in their clinic. They are discovering that the method, this house-to-house -house method, is very effective. And if we stay in our clinic, we will die of hunger. Let's change our method. Let's go house-to-house. -house. They started going house-to-house. -house. Is there any other thing you notice before we stop it, sister? Or preach Jesus. Sister? No, you are going too far. We are still looking at what will we say the ministration of Brother Paul left. Brother? If, no, that is a result later. That's a different result. We are, there are many things we are looking at, but we are taking it steadily. Brother? Praise the Lord. Okay? That's interesting. That Paul so ministered in a way that even those who don't want to believe, they are tempted to emulate his method of going around and his method of doing the job. It was like, as soon as Paul entered into that territory, if you don't use Paul's method, you are not going to get anything. Are you understanding that now? In our own lives, you know there are times that we have churches in a community and the only thing that that community know that we know how to do is what? Is to shout in the night. And whenever you ask them, who are the people there? They say they are those cry cry people. It's a cry cry church. And a beer parlor can be facing the church direct. It does not disturb their sales. You are not understanding me? So that church can go on. The other business also goes on and there's no problem. Neither are they even trying to use 
anything to cover up in order for their business to continue. They just knew that you have no consequence unto what they are doing. But look at this place. The Bible said, We adore you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. We don't preach that Jesus, we know. Are you understanding that? Even in the minds of these exorcists, they know the difference. As our administration been able, even when people are not yet converted, as he really left them with a clear understanding of their own state, of their own condition, they said, whom Paul preaches, we adore you in the name of Jesus, by that Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the evil spirit answered. So, what again will you say is the effect of Paul's ministration on the devil? That's the next thing we are looking at. From that scripture. Yes, sister. Yes. How did we know? Okay, sister. Even the demons, brother. Sister, thank you, sir. Demons, they knew Paul. Demons. Do you know what they said? They said, Jesus, I know. You are not the one to tell me about Jesus. I know him. And if he's here now, I know what to do. I know what to do. This is not the first time I encountered him by accident. I have ever had accident with that man. And I can never forget what happened to me. Jesus, I know. But the demon didn't stop there. What did the demon say? I'm poor. I know. I know him too. You don't need to talk about Paul. We know him. Is a popular man in our circle. Whenever we have reason to discuss Jesus, we must discuss Paul. Paul! We know him. But you people, who are you? From where are you coming? Show us your credential. Who are you people? What must have happened? That's the question before us this moment. That even in hell, as they knew Jesus, they also know Paul. What has happened? And for several of us that are doing fitter, 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 up and down, what is the testimony in hell concerning us? So if there was a star, if there was a serious attack on the personality of Paul, we know where it has come from. From where could it have come? From hell. Because when they discuss Jesus, people say, look, Jesus, they say, don't mention that man. No. He's, a, he's a serious man. He's okay. But what of Paul? Let's discuss Paul. He said, whatever we can do to undo that Paul, let's do it quick. I would like you to think. You know, we are not studying these scriptures because we have nothing to study. We are trying to find out. When somebody say a door and an effectual door was opened to him, what do we mean? That's the issue. A ministry that costs everybody living around to hear the word of God. 
a ministry that both publicly and house to house, house to house, confronted you with the reality of the Savior. A ministry that within two years, Brother Paul could stand up and talk to those people and said, am I not free from the blood of every one of you? Say, Let any of you stand up now to say anything against me. Did I not come to your house? And yet there are people in your own local church who the only time you discuss them is when somebody brought a report that that sister is doing this, she needs to be disciplined. You couldn't publicly stand up and confront that sister that, have I not warned you over this issue personally? You cannot stand up before that sister and boldly say, when I came to your house the last time, didn't we deal with this issue? Didn't I pray for you? But Brother Paul, he gathered all of them together and said, now all of you, testify against me, if any of you can. If I had not declared the whole counsel of God to you, publicly and from house to house. Such that the exorcists, they have to change their method of trade. Such that the exorcist have to try his own method. Such that demons also have a clear testimony. Whereas the exorcist, whenever they have exorcist association of Ephesus, eh? you know they have, like you have an uh, association of medical uh, practitioners of Nigeria. Eh? They may have had that association. And somebody will have raised that issue and say, let us review in the light of current happenings in our province, our method of practice. This one will say, have you noticed that a man came into this county just two years ago and he has made our business to suffer so much? They say, what did he do? They say, those of us who are professionals, whereas we used to beat people, sometimes we have to make fire and incense to drive away the demons. This man just comes. He just speaks and says, in Jesus' name, go out. And the thing just finished like that. What we do in two months, he does it in two minutes. Ah. In that meeting, another person might say, ah, do you know again, people don't even need to go there. They just send and catch him. And that man will just rub his face. And when they go like this and lay it on the demonics, and lay it on the people that are sick, do you know what even happens? They get healed. It looks as if we ought to become his disciples. We would like to send some of you to go and understudy him but from afar. Watch the way he handles things in case you can come and give us a seminar. Are you understanding that now? They must have come quietly in the congregation understanding Paul from afar. Such was the effect of the ministry of Paul in that community. And demons also said, in our own meeting, there's no day that passed that we don't discuss these two personalities. We discuss Jesus and we discuss his servant, Paul. To us, you can't mention Jesus without mentioning Paul. To us, you can't talk of Paul. Because Paul has nothing to say except that man, Jesus. As long as Paul is around, Jesus is our problem. And if we can even dodge Jesus, this man, Paul, will never stop talking about him. We know him. And so when the quake, 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 quake children of Skepha, the son of the high priest, you are not understanding. These are children, religious children. They are born by a priest. They now want to take laws into their hands. They also want to do what Paul does. The demons say, well, if it was Paul now, we know we can do nothing. He's the one that can slap us and go scoffing. Is the one that when he say, get out, 
the best thing to do if you don't want to break your neck is to run. But don't think that because we are running for Paul, <laughs> that we run for everybody. Don't ever make that mistake that because we are doing jini, 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 anytime Paul spoke, that any jig and hurry can cause us confusion like that. We know Paul. And we know Jesus. And who are you? Who are you to challenge us like that? Who are you to say we should run out for you? If we run for Paul, we know what we are running for. So that raises another question. Because what the exhausted said is exactly what Paul will say. What will Paul say whenever he sees demon? I adjure you in the name of Jesus. Get out! And the boys also spoke the same words. And the demons didn't run away from them, but they will run away when it was Paul who spoke. What do you think is the difference? I'm asking you. Yes, brother. Uh, yes, brother. Yes, sister. Okay, thank you, brother. Paul has the reality. Thank you, brother. Paul has the anointing. Yes, brother. Brother. So, yes, brother. Yes, brother. Sister. Brother. 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 Sister. Brother, the what? Okay, brother. 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 Brother in glasses. Praise the Lord. Brother, SEC. So, you have said it now. <laughs> the professors and the possessors. He has said it. Is that not the conclusion of this matter? That it is not in what you say. And did it ever matter to you that you also you have preached a good message from a Bible verse and people walked out or at best they said that's a good message and another person preached the same message from the same Bible verse and the people started to repent as it occurred to you could the difference be in the issue of life I don't know whether what I'm raising is correct. That the Bible we preach now wasn't different from what the elders preached. What is the difference? Remember that Gehazi was under Elisha. Do you remember that? You remember that Gehazi was sent one day to carry the rod of Elisha to go and heal a dead child. And when he went there, did the child rise up? When Elisha went, what happened? What could be the difference? Can you be a professor and not a possessor? As a minister, 
Why do others speak and demons run? And when you speak, they laugh. What happens? That you labor and labor and labor and labor and labor and men laugh. And another just do the same thing and there's a result. Can we find out as we keep praying together? That's the essence of our study. There are some of these that there's no way we can use biblical explanation. I mean, our, our knowledge. Maybe God is the one to answer that for us. Praise the Lord. Can we take off again from there? Let's check something else. When we say a ministry is effective, are you with us? Can we now read from verse 18, 19, and 20? And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of those also who used magical arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Brethren, what else will an effective ministration bring? We are trying to define an effective ministration. What again did you see there between verse 18 and verse 20? Very quickly. Who has seen something? Brother. Change in lives and public restitution. The Bible said, can somebody read that verse 18, either from NIV or from Good News or from Living Bible? Many of those who now believed, they did what? They came and do what? Openly confessed their evil deeds. Good news. You, you are not getting view. Who are these people who came? Eh? They were believers. Can you imagine that there were believers? Sitting, singing, clapping hands. But when something effective happened, they couldn't hide again under the pulpit. The Bible said they came and did what? And showed their works. They brought out their magical books, those who used them, and bound them. And bound them. When we have an effective ministration, do we beg men to make a public confession of the works of their hands? Will a ministry have been effective we are fornicators. They can sit down and take Holy Communion and say, well, it's my private business. Would that have been an effective ministry? Will it be an effective ministry that sinners can go in and out in church, relaxed, unchallenged, undisturbed? And there may be some of us, haven't you asked yourself questions? Especially when you discover that people that you thought were serious Christians in your church, in your group, in your ministry, when you find them doing terrible things. Have you not asked? What is it that has happened? You may blame them, but why don't we start from here? Was I effective and they were still able to hide? Could fire be burning out of my life and people still are able to rub in and say, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can fire burn and people will be doing like that? Is it possible? What is the issue? That's the question we are asking this night, I mean this moment, as we are seeking understanding from God. And I perceive that 
any of us who is here, we are here because we want a change. Amen. We are discovering the reality of our own present situation, even as leaders. Even as leaders of fellowships, leaders of groups, leaders of churches. That we speak, even as elders. How many times as elders we speak? And people that we know, as, they, are, they have committed sin. They argue with us. And when they finish arguing with us, they bang the door over us. They say, go away with your church. If that's how you want to run your church, I will leave it for you. And they go to another church. And nothing has happened to them. Have you wondered? Are we so weak that men walk out on our lives? Are we so weak that the same word that burnt down the sins of men, when it comes to our own mouth, it only suits them? Are you bothered to have asked a question? The things that, that, that turn people's life upside right, when it came to my own mouth, I said the same thing. They laughed and walked away. Lord, what is happening to my life? That's the reason we are studying this. And that's the reason we are praying. Let's get the last thing in that, in that particular case study. There are other cases we will be looking at very soon. I know we have moved very fast, but we are going to just take that. Now, can you go quickly to verse 23? Let us see again what is an effective ministration. We are trying to define it. Chapter 20, I mean chapter 19, verse 23. Can I have a brother from this side to read with a loud voice from verse 23? Talk. There arose no small star about that way. I don't know what you are getting. What did you get? It's like commotion. It's like you go to market. What are they talking? What are they talking about that way? You go to the blacksmith shop. What are they talking? You go to the Allot's house. What are they discussing? That way. It looks as if this thing has become dominant. It looks as if there's nowhere you go. This thing will not leave me alone. And a certain man, verse 24, named Demetrius, a silver smith who made silver shrines for Diana and brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the, with the workmen of like occupation. Are you seeing an emergency meeting now? Emergency meeting of which people? Blacksmith Association of Ephesus eh? and Allied Industries. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's what the Bible said now. Men of like occupation and convener. Who is convener? The metros. When the meeting convened and people sat, the metros must have stood up and said, Sirs, I'm sorry to disturb your program, but I think there's an urgent situation that we have to reason about. They said, yes, what is it? Sirs, you know that by this craft, we have our wares. Everybody say, yes, 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 yes. That's our business. Yes. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, these poor. Why did he use the word these poor? I would like us to think about it quick. Why did he, in, in, the, in the Association of Blacksmith and Allied Industries, why did he use this poor? Yes? Poor was popular. If Paul was a queer, queer man that nobody knows, how will he have introduced that matter? He said, Sars, a certain man from Tarsus by name Paul, a man who is not too tall and not too short. And people say, which Paul is that? Which Paul? No, Paul. 
Hmm, we have never heard. But he knew that he wouldn't be making any assumption by saying this poor. Now, when he said this poor, what do you think was the response? They said, ah, yes, 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 speak on, speak on, speak on, speak on. Why? Because he must have been to their own house also. So once he said, this poor, everybody started remembering when he came to our house, when he came near my house, when the demon that I was tying down in order to collect money, as soon as that demon saw him, he said, Paul, have you come to confuse us here? Have you come to confuse us here? And Paul just went and said, keep quiet. Get out in the name of Jesus. And the person got healed. And without settling my beer, he went back home. All of them have testimonies of how they encountered this Paul. So when he began the story, look at what he said. You see, all of you, you see. And you have heard that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia. This Paul has persuaded. What is another word for persuade? He has convinced and turned away many people saying that there are no gods which are made with hands. What is the effect of the ministration of Lord Paul? From the mouth of the blacksmith. I'm not talking of those of us that you go and preach a message in a campus. By next week, you will print out magazine. I gave a powerful message last week. I'm not talking of people like you. Who, if you do something small, you must print a magazine. And then you will take a photograph. Like that. They said, the man of God in action. <laughs> Where was this testimony coming out from now? From the Blacksmith Association of Ephesus. And what was their testimony, please? What was the testimony? In verse 26, what was the testimony? This Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that there are no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft, is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. What was the effect of the ministry of Paul? On Asia. What was the effect? Most people have been turned away. Number one. Number two. The great goddess has been despised. The temple is being abandoned. What else again? The craftsmen who propagate that business. What has happened now? It has collapsed. When will our lives become a threat unto hoteliers? When will our ministry become a threat unto men whose business is propagating unrighteousness such that they will call an emergency meeting to discuss no other agenda but our names. When will a top management meeting be called in your office to discuss you, how by your presence, bribery and corruption, no more tribes in this office? When? When, as a teacher in the secondary school, Will all other teachers call an emergency meeting and say, by virtue of the, this man, all the girls that used to mess up around with us, they are saying, they are now saying, the things I used to do, I do them no more. When? 
You see, an effective ministration is not the one that is self-propagating itself inside church. An effective ministration is not that which an official, and you note, you note, you note some dangerous thing that is coming up around us. You see, official newsletter of so and so and so and so and so ministry. I'm not too sure they had official newsletter that time. Because if they had official newsletter, it is that one that they will have been reading. But even now that we have it, what does it mean? Who, who reads it? Except our own supporters who agree to be brainwashed. When will emergency meeting be called in secular circles? to discuss the ministry of this poor. How is causing confusion for us? When will the Parent Teachers Association of secondary schools and similar schools be called to discuss the effect of our administration among young people? When? Few, many years ago, when God began to do some few works, and that was the very beginning, how many parents kept crying left and right? SU, 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 SU. There was a kind of effect that if you get into an office and they say it's an SU, ah, even the GM. Is I don't want to have an SU in my office. It will not let you rest. Every day in a trap. All the girls that will be coming to see GM, this girl will just corner them and they will go back. And all the girls will say, we fear coming to your office because of your secretary. She just talks as if she knows what is going on in our heart. We won't come. Fix appointment at another place. When will the life of the Christian become so effective and let's see the result of that meeting. The communique that they signed. And when they had these things, they were full of wrath. Verse 28. And they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Why are they now sh shouting? Who need now to shout? I'm asking you. Who need now to shout? Because they need now to attack to themselves that the thing is still great. But do you know the problem with us now? We are the ones. Who do what? Who now shout? The great man of God will pray for you. He has traveled from uh, London to America, from America to Jamaica, from Jamaica to South Africa, from South Africa to all of Nigeria. He will pray for you. Did you see a change? Did you notice a, a shift? It was the other people because they were intimidated that needed to reaffirm and assert themselves and shout because they think that people are no more hearing them. They said, we need to shout it to them. They are no more hearing us. Great! It's, it's Diana. Great! So they moved out of that meeting. They said, the only thing to do, we must carry placard. We must do awareness program. Awareness. Who will lead the match first? The metro say, I'm number one. Great, 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 great. Then multi together. What are you shouting about? What are you shouting about? What are you shouting? They say, we need to shout. We need to shout. We need to shout. Great is the goddess Diana. Great is the goddess Diana. People are still watching. What is it? Why are you shouting? What has come on you? What's the matter of shouting? Great. What do you mean by that? And because they were causing confusion, the Bible said the whole city was filled with confusion. Having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, false companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Praise the Lord. You know what they went to do now? They went and got Brother Paul's companions. They caught them. They just want to cause confusion. May God help our lives to change. 
I think what we are doing now is more of propaganda, which the Blacksmith Association ought to have been doing. The church is beginning to feel inferior. Every minister that has to talk so much about himself, I want to tell you, is an inferiority complex. It's a sign that something is empty, and we need to shout it for them to know that we are around. Where there is life, you don't need to talk much. Hallelujah. If a sister were to be cooking soup behind the pastor's office, and the aroma of that soup began to come out, I want to ask you, what can we do so that it will not enter our nose? Eh? What can we do? Nothing. Except we want to run out. Is the sister driving us out? But can we stay comfortable again? No way. If there is life, an aroma of God's grace issuing out of your life, why talk so much? Why do you approach it that way? I met colleague ministers. I said, brother, why are you doing this? He said, look, it's the way you present yourself that people will accept you. Come in and tell them. The way you are introduced is the way people will listen to you. I said, mm. I didn't know that that's the gimmick. Why are you so much shouting? Is it a silent evidence that reality has departed? When your authority is no more a spiritual authority but an official authority. Authority asserted by titles. Brother, we are facing reality. We are not talking about the man who is not here. We are talking about ourselves. What made those men to succeed and we are not? That's the issues we are raising. But I believe that when we don't know what to look for, we can pray a right. Can we? Can we? Until we start to look at what an effective ministration looks like. How many of us are taking for granted that we are preaching the gospel actually? When we started defining effective ministration in 1 Corinthians 16, do you imagine how all of us, we said uh, effective administration is this and that. Now that we are looking at it practically, can I ask you, how effective has your own life been? And this question is not as if you should answer it in comparison with your neighbor. Before God, before whom all of us are going to stand, how effective is my ministration? How effective is the work of my life as far as the kingdom of Jesus Christ is concerned? And we are not talking to a stranger. We are talking to our Father who is able to help us. So if we open up our lives to Jesus this moment and say, Lord, I don't want to deceive myself. I don't seem to have, to have, have a firm grip of what it means to serve you. Lord, have mercy on me. I believe is going to help us. Praise the Lord. Let's conclude. And when Paul will have entered in unto the people, the disciples permitted him not. And certain of the chief of Asia who are his friends sent unto him, beseeching him that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And the greater part knew not for what reason they were come together. Did you see the, the matter? I'm sure those blacksmiths, they are very wise. If they went about to tell the story of why they caused that confusion, they may not be able to mobilize anybody. Are you understanding? Were they able to go around and say, excuse, our, our business is in danger. That's why we are making noise. Majority wouldn't have followed them. Are you understanding? So what they did was just to jumble words together. 
So that the Bible says a greater part of the congregation does not even know why they gathered. They just want to cause a subtraction and to discredit Paul so that they can deport him from that, from that area. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with a hand and will have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, for about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great. Oh, can you imagine that? That is how they used wisdom just to stop momentarily the ministry of Brother Paul in that place. But did it stop? Did it stop? May God help us in Jesus' name. Now, I know we have moved very fast. We are already, we are already looking at number A under section A. We are saying discuss in the light of biblical examples and contemporary history. What are the parameters? or notable features of an effective ministration. Praise the Lord. Have you seen that? So let's look at John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 5 to 8. Somebody should quickly read that. Now we have set enough ground. We'll just use these people to conclude and confirm what we are talking about. Matthew 3. Can I have... Yes, read it. Go on, read on, please. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you read that scripture also from Mark, you will find the same thing. Now, in the light of this example, what is the parameter of an effective ministration? We are taking John the Baptist now as another example. This is a man who didn't perform any miracle. We didn't see him casting out any demon. He did not heal any sick. Yet, the Bible said, then went out unto him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about the Jordan, baptized by him, confessing their sins. What is a, what is a notable parameter of an effective ministration? Here, brother. He brought people to the Lord. Yes? Yes, brother. They came to him. What do you mean by that? They came. A true anointing attracts. Did you hear what I said? What did I say? Attracts. A true anointing does not cajole people to come. An effective life, an effective ministration, normally draws men. They came. Who are the people that came? Let's check it out. Eh? Great, great, great religious leaders. Can we check the book of Luke? Maybe it is in Luke. We notice where... So Jamie also came. Luke chapter 3. Let's see the message he preached. I want, I'm, we are drawing some certain illustrations to see what we are looking for. If we get that reality, hallelujah. Chapter 3. Have you seen chapter 3? Go to verse 7. Want somebody to jump and read verse 7 for us. Now wait. Is that how to preach? For people to stay? Hmm? 
you a pastor. You want people to be coming into the church. What do you say in, in our lesson on homiletics and sermon delivery? What were we taught? How many of you have been to Bible school? In homiletics and sermon delivery. Brother, what do we say when you want to present a sermon? Just teach us a little of uh, the biblical theology. Give an example. Just give an illustration. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother, thank you. That's the reality. Say, good morning, beloved brethren. I know you are good people. And I know that God loves you. Say amen to that, brother. And I want all of you to stand up and give somebody a hug right now. Say, I am happy to be here. Brother, I am happy to be here. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. This, sermon, this service wouldn't have been complete except you are here. You are a special person. Hallelujah. We love you with the love of the Lord. That is homiletics. That is sermon delivery. It is the way we have learned in the absence of anointing to keep men. When reality begins to fade away from our lives, because there is no vacuum in nature, something must occupy that space. If you go and look at our theological curriculum, there's a lot of sociology. And it is not different from the sociology we learn in the social sciences. Personnel management. We have quietly resorted back to the world system to please instruct us what are their advertisement principles? Every time I'm passing through Jaws, and I came to this uh, signboard, Nasco Biscuit. Do you know what Nasco Biscuit says? He said, we are what all other biscuits are trying to be. I said, ah, how did they bring out that kind of cute statement? I don't know whether you have noticed as we go around town on the signboard of churches, on the signboard of uh, posters and all kinds of things. Did you notice some great advancement in advertisement? We are doing it almost better than the world. What does that show to us? Something is missing that we need to make up. But look at the way this man introduced his own sermon. What did he say? In verse 7, what was the opening statement of that sermon? <laughs> oh, generations of vipers, who has warned you to flee from Lord to come? That is the opening statement of a sermon. That people came for meeting. And he stood up and said, Oh, ye generation of vipers and very, very wicked and crooked people, <laughs> a, bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of Confucianists, fornicators and adulterers, cheats, who has invited you to this church today? Who has told you to come here? And he was not afraid that next week you will not have anybody. When you see men bold on the truth of the scriptures, don't imitate them except you have the anointing. Don't go 
and stand up and say, yes, I tell you, you are nothing. If you say like that, and you don't have the basic invisible element that attracts, you will go hungry. <laughs> that is the reality. Some people have attempted it. And everything has collapsed. So they have gone back to take their lessons again. Are you blaming people? That they are cajoling people? They are telling people that God loves them and all that? If you don't have this secret determinant that attracts people, I advise you, go and learn from them. Did you hear me? Don't say you want to be the John the Baptist of our time when you don't have what John the Baptist had. Don't say I will preach tough. Don't say I'm a fearless preacher. I tell it as it is. If you don't have the requisite anointing, you will just be a noisemaker. Look at this man. When he spoke and spoke and spoke. Verse 9. And now also the earth is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore we bring it not for fruit is ended and cast into the fire. People say excuse. 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 What shall we do then? Stop talking. Tell us what to do now, 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 now. What shall we do then? Excuse. We know. We are not arguing with you. We are a generation of vipers. We are gen that's what we are. Look me, I'm a fornicator. But the question is, what shall we do then? Do you notice then in that scripture? Do you notice then? What's the meaning of then there? After what you have said, we are not as that one is accepted. Accepted. No argument. But what shall we do then? What will generation of vipers do then? Excuse me. What will a fornicator like me do then? In office, what you have preached, I've got it accepted. But tell me, tell me, tell me, it's urgent. I can't allow you to finish. He answered and said to them, He that has two coats, let him impart him to that has none. He that has food, let him do the same. Then came also task collectors to be baptized. Task collectors. And he said unto him, Teacher, what shall we do? We are tax collectors. We have been cheating people. We have been collecting money illegally. Can tax collectors like me, can I be saved? What shall I do? When, when last have you had anybody asking you such a question in your ministration? See, we that they are sinners. And it didn't occur to them that they are sinners. Are you understanding? We are the one also to tell them to confess. And we are the one also to tell them what to confess. And we are the one also yeah, say after me. Say after me. I have gone astray. I have gone astray. I'm a fornicator. I'm a fornicator. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. Lord, I have not been doing well. When you say I have not been doing well, the voice of people go down. Say, say now, I have not been doing well. Mm -hmm. Because, you say, mm -mm. I can't tell a lie. I have been doing well. I have been doing well. I don't even know why you called me out. <laughs> I thought you said those that want the blessing of God should come. I did not know you just want, I have been doing well. I have been doing well in my own case. I have been doing well. They are arguing with you even on the altar. <laughs> Is it not time to talk to God? Is it not time to quietly stand apart and say, Lord, why is my own ministry different? Why do I go up and down, up and down, up and down, begging, begging, begging? Are there no churches where church members are so powerful? And when they are there, 
if you're about to make a statement and they look at you with the corner of, your, of their eyes like this, you say, oh, hmm, praise the Lord. Then you change the message. Or when you finish, because you said, uh, the kind of thing you preach on Sunday, I don't understand it. And if you continue doing that kind of thing, we will withdraw our support. That's how you preach and you scatter people. You should have told people that they will be blessed. You didn't give altar call for healing. And yet, all the people that came with me, they will have been more encouraged if you told them that somebody is there whose business is collapsing and that God is going to make their business to grow. Every time you are busy, amani, amani, sin. Stop talking about this kind of sin. We are in the age of grace. Tell people grace. Tell them how Jesus loves them. Tell them that my God shall meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Why, why are you making your own service to be as cold as if we are in a graveyard? When you talk small, get the people's response. Ask them to shout hallelujah. We will support achievers, not losers. I just felt I should tell you that before we change our mind. And then you, ordained of God, you come back home, your heart shivani. Oh Lord, this message. God, so I made a mistake. I shouldn't have commented like that. I should have been more careful. Father, please give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Which wisdom? You are threatened. But listen, if you don't have anointing that attracts. Why don't you look for it? I believe that there can be no revival until the reality of God's power and of his word is restored back. In, the, in this study, don't worry, that is taking time to look at definition. It's important. Then when we go back and we start looking at how can I get that anointing? How can I a hand do money in my ministry? And if God grants us to reach that level, in our study. It will be okay. But let's get this clear. Why can't I go to God and pray? I said, Lord Jesus, something is missing. Now, look at us collectors. What did they say? Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise also line up. We are soldier men. We are senior, senior army officers. And what shall we do? Do you know the way they are asking their question? Conviction of their sin has gripped them. They now say, what shall we do? We, we are so jamais. And when they say like that, they are telling stories. They say, we are so jamais. And you know what we do? We normally use gum to make our way. If you have a group of soldiers in Kaduna now, if they are not confined to barracks, if they came out now, and they want to get anything from the market, because they always obey the last command, isn't it? Just come out and say, get out there, get out there, give him. And if you refuse, he will beat you thoroughly and collect it and go away. So, brother, the soldiers have never changed. Right from many generations to generations, it's the same life. If we are going to reach soldier men, we must reach them truly. He said, do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely. Be content with your wages. Is that not the problem of Sojame? Eh? I'm asking, is that not the problem with Sojame? So if major generals are to be in this congregation now, and it is John the Baptist who will preach to them, what will he say to them? Do violence to no man. Stop that thing you are doing. All the plot of land. You have used force to confiscate from the local owners. Go and return it. That will be the message. But in our own generation, if a corner, a corner repents according to our own repentance and came to fellowship, in two months he will be the chairman of something. The plot of land that he's claiming to have, he got it by violence. He has not returned it. 
yet he will be somebody. And every new visitor that comes, we must take him to the corner and say, here you make corner this. He's a full member of our church. When anointing is absent. But some of you may be laughing because you have never faced the peril of being a preacher. That's all your life. And you are not seeing success. This kind of study, I wish anybody who is careless outside there, don't, you don't need to, to put your mouth in this. We are talking to people who have donated their lives to do this work full time. They are the ones that can tell when you are not sure what to eat. And somebody just suddenly came to church. See how you will rally around him to make sure fish. I do not blame men. But I think what has brought us to that situation is that something is missing somewhere. Can we get it back? Can we personally, individually pray and say, Lord, have mercy on us. Hallelujah. And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts concerning John, whether he were the Christ or not. And as they were doing that, I said, ah, is this the Christ? Is it the Christ? He jumped and said, and some of you are thinking that I'm Christ. Listen, all that I'm doing to you now, all this baptism that I did do to you, now what out? Now what out? Now what out? As you see this thing going on, now what out? Somebody is coming behind me, mightier. In fact, it's so large, I'm not even qualified to unloose. It's the one when it comes. It's not coming with what out. It's coming with what? If you are musing your heart, say, Ha! This man! Ha! This man! Look at how he's pretty! He's great! Is this? He said, No, now what out? Whatever you are seeing from me now, now what out? Prepare to meet the man with fire. Who is coming to shake, to shake, to shake, to shake, to shake. Prepare to meet Jesus. He gave a correct impression. He didn't present Jesus to the people as a mediocre. Unfortunately, in our own time, servants of God, they get more honor than the God of the servants. They get more respect than their master. It bothers me. That men sing anthems to welcome us. And they say nothing about Jesus. It's a very serious issue. But have you seen the ministry of John the Baptist? Did you see what we are calling effective ministration? And where was Mr. John? Where was he? He was in the wilderness. He was never in the center of town. And I want you to know, when a true anointing comes, people will travel far and wide. If you are staying in the bush, they will come there. Listen, it is not uh, going around showing yourself here and there that will bring multitude. It is anointing. If you keep anointing in the bush, people will trace it. I don't know how it happens. But like I tell you, if somebody is here now with an open sock, undressed, what do you discover? All the flies in this environment. What will happen? Where are they coming? They will come straight to that place. How did they know? How did they know? They perceived the odor. I believe that the, the, the smell sense of flies can even be stronger than that of our nose. They just come there quietly and they are settling. They know. They have been told. Hallelujah. And I told you, if a good soup is being cooked somewhere and the aroma is coming, if you want to get to that place, do you need anybody to, to direct you? What, how will you reach the place? Just follow this man. 
if you move outside, the smell will not be that way. So, no, it's not there. I'm not smelling it again. You know, I'm not the thing will take you to where exactly the thing is being cooked. Brother, have you laid your life on the altar? Such that it is being burnt and it is producing a sweet smell. Men will dress it. I don't see anything that it costs to serve God except life. I don't believe I need promotion to do what God wants me to do. There's only one qualification. What is that qualification? The issue of life as an aroma. You cannot deny where life is coming out. It compels you to go there. Sometimes you get to park where a lot of canteens. You see all these guests standing out. Come to our shop. Come to our shop. Come to our shop. They don't know the best, the best way to get people. What is the best way? Put a good soup on fire with a good, very strong, appealing smell. What will happen? They will go there. Regardless of all these other girls that I say, come here, come here, delicious food. No, 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 I know. There's nothing delicious. I'm already smelling something like a bono soup there and it's beautiful. I'm going there. You see people, they will line up. The madam will be cooking and serving, cooking and serving. People will still be lining up. There are others that since money they cook, their food is very, very cold now. What is the matter? The aroma. Brother, I don't believe you need to be in town. For God to fulfill his ministry in your life. I see so many preachers. They are moving from, from village. They are moving to city. That's not it. You didn't get the prerequisite. You didn't get the prerequisite. Let, let's try. Let's make experiments. Let there be life. In the suburbs of Kaduna. Do you know people who go there? Have you heard of LLA before? Eh? LLA, where all the Catholics used to go. Have you passed that LLA before? It's a small village. Anytime I'm going to Potakon, I pass that. I say, where is this LLA? And they say, it's just this small village. How did it become popular? Somebody was there who claimed to have power. He gives water. People run there. Even if you claim to have something, people will troop there. How much more if you have the reality? I don't think advertisement is your problem. Your problem, brother, is life. Let's try it. I don't know what it takes to become anything for God apart from life, a true anointing. I don't believe, and I'm telling you with all my heart, that we need to run around for people to listen to us. I don't believe it. I just believe that when I don't have what attracts men, I better wait till I get it. No struggle. And you are foolish to struggle with a man that has the thing. Are you understanding me? You don't struggle with a man that has grace except you want to kill yourself. If you don't want to get lost, go and get the real thing. Stay in the bush, they will come there. They will run. Because life, anointing that is playing out of life, attracts. Such that you say, brother, who told you to come here? They will say, ah, I have to come. But you see, our own has changed to get a meeting in town. See the bribery and corruption that we do. We we'll call all the pastors for a dinner. Give them good food. After you have eaten, can you refuse to cooperate with the man of God? Eh? This is bribery. It dangles on few things. And say, and, and you are going to get connections. I'll connect you with some people coming from America. And after all, 
you will be our representative around bribery and corruption. You go there. You have left the reality. Above all you're getting, get anointing. Anointing that attracts. Hallelujah. Just watch it. Watch it. If we keep growing, and if God is gracious to our lives, and this thing we are crying for breaks forth in reality. People will come from all over the world. Though. Be watching it. Though. If the Holy Spirit helps, you may be surprised that when next a meeting is called, because people's lives have been affected, because they have touched the reality in your life, do you know what will happen? The whole land. They will start coming in their numbers all over. We want to go. We want to go. We want to go. We want to be there. Life attracts. What is the publicity that John did here? Eh? No publicity. Brother, did I say we should not do publicity? Let us continue to do this publicity. Let's do it very well. For in the absence of the anointing that attracts, what alternative do we have on our hands? Eh? Do I want to kill us? I say you should not do something. So what will you do? What shall we do? But those that want something better, if you will follow me, and let's go quickly to God, and say, Baba, I don't know what's happening with my own life. Why do people pass me? And they don't even look twice that somebody is around. They smell nothing. But you know there are places you pass. Whether you like it or not, you must turn. Because something is reaching your nose. Eh? Eh? Oh, brother. Brother, it is not your location that determines success of ministry. What, what determines the success? This secret anointing. I call it the determinant of ministry. This man was just in the bush. Jesus came and said, Those that are wearing soft raiments, where are they? They are in king's palaces. But this man, the what went he out in the wilderness to see? This man is not even attractive. That's what bothered me. We place great emphasis on, on, uh, on dressing and changes. Have you noticed it happening in our own town now? It looks as if dressing is anointing. And some of us, we are quietly to have some beautiful outfit. We now wear one big something like that. And when we are praying, just do like this. Something is shifting. We now wear three piece. Oh God, very beautiful. Am I saying we should not wear dress? Do you think I'm preaching we should not be wearing good dresses? God forbid. Though. You think I want us to be wearing rags? No, please. Please. If God provides for you, wear your suit. Iron it very well. But if that were the thing you were depending upon to attract men, you miss it. When anointing came, who cared about what the man of God wore? You don't know. Brother, when people have time to look at your shoe and look at your tie and look at your head, it's because what they came to look for they didn't see. And because there's no vacuum in nature, they have to look at something else. I'm telling you, brother. If they see the personality that they came for, Jesus, they will forget you. When you became the center of attraction on the pulpit, what, what, clear, what, what other clear indication to show you that the master is not around? When you finish preaching, and somebody came and said, Oh, brother, Pastor, praise God. Hi, hallelujah. This is good. It's good. You are piano beautiful now. Please, when you get home, tell your wife that we appreciate what she's doing. If that were what is making you happy, brother, I suggest to you that something is wrong quietly in your life. Who 
too hard time to look at how Mr. John dressed. When Major General lined up and said, Excuse, we are soldier men. And you know what it means to be a soldier. What shall we do then? Task collector said, We are task collectors. And you know what that means. You know us. What shall we do then? And public women said, We are public women. Who, who, who feel the vacancy in the lives of empty men? What shall we do then? Repent and bring forth the fruit of repentance. He shouted on them. They started shouting, Excuse, I want to repent. They go and bring forth the fruit. Don't ever say that Abraham is your father. Don't. I don't want to hear that empty testimony from your mouth. Show us the truth. Bring forth fruit of repentance. And they all rushed to be baptized by John. And it became something that people are happy with that John baptized me. Hallelujah. John baptized me. So when people started saying, John baptized me, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized by John? You know what that means for John to baptize you. John now stood up and said, are you rejoicing that I baptize you? Now what out? That baptism now what out? The summary of my ministry is what? Water. Somebody is coming behind me. Look at John. A man who will never exploit anointing. He must decrease. Jesus must increase. Brother. Have you got the prerequisite for an effective ministration before we stop? You all know the ministry of Jesus. Let's read the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 4, 23 to 25. We have a few minutes to close, but I believe that if we get our definitions right, we might know what we are asking us to pray about. Matthew 4, and verse 23. Who is reading for us? Yes. From beyond each other. Did you say, did you hear that they said they brought to, to him people that were taken with diverse diseases? One of those occasions. Jesus was invited to a house to come and eat. This was a private dinner. Is it dinner or lunch? A lunch. And uh, it was not announced. But this man. Dismay. Hallelujah. Dismay. When he passed through a town, dismay spread. Ah! Hmm, 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 hmm. Have you seen Hunter's dog before? Do you know Hunter's dog? Have you noticed them? How do they hunt? <laughs> if a rat ever passed by, since you cannot add your odor. You can't hide it. The dog. <laughs> Don't ever fight your dog because he knows what he's doing. You go here, do that. You say, What is there? There's nothing there. Go, go. You say, He knows. I'm, he, I'm smelling something. I smell a rat. So when Jesus passed, the odor of anointing must have spread. I'm not talking of the perfume, the loving that, that they do now. And you just throw on your body and you're coming and say, hmm, that's not it. Though. Then these people heard that Jesus, the way we are noticing the smell, it has entered this small house. They started tracing it. By the time they reached, other hundreds of thousands were tracing the same smell. They discovered that it was already a large gathering, not announced. The four friends said, what do we do? 
We have traveled from a long way. We can't go back. They quickly employed the services of a carpenter. Carpenter, whatever it will cost, dismantle the roof. And people were so engrossed listening to Jesus that whatever the carpenter was doing on the roof, they were not distracted. Anointing that keeps men from distraction. Anointing that, that, that arrests attention and sustains it as long as possible. Do you know Jesus? He had preached for three days, three nights non-stop. And nobody moved. Eh? Do you preach for 30 minutes? And like, mm. You better check. Maybe something is absent. The carpenter was doing ba, bu, ba, bu, ba. Nobody cared. They did not even hear. Until they suddenly saw the sky open over their head. They said, What's happening? Some said, We are in a trance. In a trance. Until the paralytic man was let down by the four friends at the feet of Jesus. Even if Jesus didn't want to heal the man. <laughs> Haven't they tried? To have gone all that way. Anointing will make people sweat to touch Jesus. People will pay anything. They will dismantle anything they can dismantle to touch a true anointing. Let's keep growing if you want to. I thought it is necessary because these were days. You see, in the days of Zerubbabel, the Bible said, when they erected the, the, the temple, some people were crying. Some people were rejoicing. Do you remember? Who are those people that were rejoicing? Children. Who never saw the original? You know, there are some of us here. Every time we are saying, let's pray for revival. Let's pray for the power of God. Some of us say, waiting. What are they talking about? These brethren, they are sadists. They just like to make people sad. How can you say I don't have anointing? When the Spirit of God is moving so seriously in my body, in fact, ah, we fell under the power. Since I've been reading the story of um, Paul, of John the Baptist, of Jesus, was there a parameter falling under power? Eh? We missed something. We emphasize non-entities when reality is not there. Oh, I minister. And hundreds were slain in the spirit. And so what? I have not read that one yet. In the, all these that I've been reading. Whether they were slain or not, that's not the matter. What matter is that after they were slain, what happened? How they were slain, what's our business about that? That as a man of God stood up to preach. Oh, the people just were the grass. And so what? Children that were born in the wilderness, they never were circumcised because they were born when their fathers were in the wilderness. There are some of us that the best is what is happening to us now. Because you were born at a time in the history of the church when reality is very scarce. It's difficult for us to pray. What are we praying about? When we never even know what it ought to have been in the beginning. Some of us are rejoicing now that we have received the Holy Ghost. We have received the Holy Ghost. You say, how do you know you have received the Holy Ghost? Say, by speaking in tongues. That's the climax of baptism in the Holy Spirit for us now. For them, in the New Testament, it was not. If you spoke in tongues alone, and you shook your body and you went home, you've received nothing in their own days. You remember when they gathered again, say, God, hear their threats. Grant unto your servants boldness and power. That with boldness we may declare the resurrection of your son. And the Bible said, when they had prayed, the place shook. But what is that the is that the matter? Is that the matter? Was there full stop at the end of that statement? What was the next thing? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And great grace was upon them all. And with great boldness they went and declared the, the gospel. And multitude were added. To the church as many as are ordained to be saved. Is that not the testimony in Acts chapter 4? But if it were us now, when we are writing our own testimony, it said, 
and we had a prayer meeting. And the place where the brethren prayed did what? Shook! Hallelujah! That will be the end of our own testimony. You needed to check that to pray for revival, there's need to understand what was it in the beginning. To say we are asking for anointing, some people say, what are we asking for again? Me, I've already been baptized in the Holy Ghost. What are they asking for again? I don't blame you. You were born at a time when reality has departed in our midst. Don't worry. Those people that saw the, the temple in its glory, what, what were they doing? They were weeping profusely. They said, God, this is a downgrading. This is a downgrading. I'm sure those young children said, Daddy, please, don't spoil our joy here. We are happy people. Praise the Lord. We, are, we don't believe in this cry, cry thing. Don't bring this cry, cry to us. Don't believe cry, cry. We are happy people. We believe in singing and clapping. We don't like all these things. You do, they make people sad. When people go for your meeting, they just sit down like this and they keep thinking, thinking. We don't believe that. Don't believe that kind of thing. We believe in joy. We preach in a church. And the Holy Spirit must have affected people. I don't know how it happened. So many people trooped out with tears, hot tears. Nobody told them they were confessing their sin by themselves. I thought the pastor of the local church is interested. I called him to please come and round up the meeting. I regretted. I told myself from that evening, I will never do it again in Jesus' name. Oh, the pastor came up. I thought he was going to pray for us. People were here crying. Some were kneeling down, some were lying flat. Nobody told them. These were your church members that, that you never got them to tell the truth. Now they are confessing profusely. Some are saying, oh, I have been the troubleshooter in this church. Oh, I have disappointed God. Oh, I'm a fornicator. Oh, this. And you know what the pastor said? Hold it. We don't believe in crime. We believe in praising God. Do you know what, what, what I do when God visits me like that? I give him a clap offering. Stop it. The time to cry has passed. He has, he has cried all our cry. Let's give Jesus a clap offering. I want you to clap to Jesus. Of course. <laughs> the people couldn't clap because they didn't see what to clap for. The thing was so cold. He raised a forceful chorus. Everybody should jump up and sing. Because I believe that Brother Billy didn't come here to make us unhappy. He came here to make us happy. Let's rejoice and be happy. But you know, I have to preach in that church for four days. I went back home. I said, Lord, wouldn't I discontinue this meeting? Shouldn't I go home and just stay and be praying my own prayer? The Holy Spirit says, no. He has never seen such a thing before. He's a pastor. He, has, he doesn't know it. Pardon him for today. Tomorrow, don't call him to pray. Treat him as an ordinary member of the congregation, for that is what he is. So I said, okay, Lord Jesus, I will obey you. I said, but I don't like this. I said, no, it is not his church. Those people, they are my people. They are only unfortunate to stay where they will not be told the right thing. So, so I went back again with all my heart, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. When the message went on again, Went on again, went on again. The Holy Spirit came again as if he wanted to try it again for us. A deep silence came down again over the whole congregation. A spontaneous response unto God came up again. This time I didn't call pastor. But do you know what happened? At the end of the meeting in the night, pastor followed me to where the Lord me and knelt down. 
I said, look, you must pray for me. I also, I also want to touch this thing. I, I, I passed so many churches. I have never touched this in my life. Pray for me. I said, Jesus, you are correct. Brother, brother, why are we looking at this? Is it that we want to just confuse ourselves? Let's see what men, the people we are going to meet in heaven. Are you understanding? Men that have got heavenly record. Men that God has approved. Let us get what they got. Even if we don't get it yet, at least we know what we are looking for. Are you getting me? A few days ago, a man of God came. He asked me a very strange question. I didn't know how to answer it. And I told him so. Because, and I, I imagined I did not know. He said, brother, permit me to ask you a, a, a personal question. I said, okay, yes, what is it? He said, please tell me the secret of your success. Oh, I was afraid of him. I, I asked him, I said, have we succeeded already? We have not yet got what we are looking for. How can I sit here now and be telling you stories? What stories do I have to tell you yet? We have not succeeded. Though. Ah, he said to him, to him, ah. I said, oh, no problem. It's because he did not see the glory of the former house. Are you understanding? He has not seen. He has not seen John the Baptist. Who went and stood in the bush. And millions threw out to him. So if he saw something small happening around, he will carry that as his own hero. And brother, do you make mistake to allow mediocres to clap for you? What will not excite a child? Let me ask you. Eh? Brother, what have you seen that doesn't excite a child? Even a madman we excite your children. And if somebody just stood and doing like this, doing like this, doing like this, doing like this, children will still gather around him. And before you know it, they will practice what he's doing. When you are a king among children, you know what kind of king you are. May you pray a prayer today. God, don't let me grow in the midst of mediocres, who will never challenge my foolishness. Don't let me be a champion in the midst of foolish people. Put me in the midst of men whose appetites are sharp for the reality of heavens. They will drive you on your knees. Develop the taste of my church members. That any day I preach a message that has no spirit inside, let them walk out on me. And when I ask them, why did you go out? They say, well, you are talking your own. As we were preaching the other time, I noticed that the anointing is not there. That's why I felt, I want just to go and pray. When you ask such people as your church members, they will do you good. Then those ones that don't know, they are not aware. Even when the spirit has departed from you for three weeks, they are not aware. It is their normal custom to clap for you all the time. Even when you say something foolish, they say, Amen! Tell God to deliver you from that congregation. They won't allow you to grow. That is if you are sincere, you want to be an effective minister. All your co-workers, pray for them. Lord, let them be matured. Let them know they are left from their right. Develop their taste in such a way that chaff will never, never hold in their mouth. So that if I fall into a situation where I don't get correct food again, it won't take two days before they throw it at my face. So I may return back to heaven. Can you pray a prayer, a serious prayer today and say, Lord, allow me not to be in the midst of men who have no eyes for heaven. 
who are satisfied with the physical things of this life. Take me away from the midst of men who cause bitter things sweet. Lord Jesus, take me away from the means of a congregation who clap and shout and say yes sir, yes sir to me even when my altar has broken down. It will do you good. If God were to answer that prayer, it means that occasionally you will come and preach and in the middle of your sermon, your mouth will be shut. Because it will be clear that there is no message. And you will stand and they say, Excuse me, brethren, I think I missed it today. And somebody say, Yes, we know. We've been praying for you. One man of God that God used in a mighty revival. I don't know whether it's Charles Finney or, or John Wesley. Said in his congregation, there were some two women, two old ladies. They always sit by the corner. Anytime he finishes preaching, when all others come shaking hands with him and say, Oh, Pastor, that's a good message. That's a good message. Oh, that's a good message. Hallelujah. Well done. Kai, you have really, really done well today. That's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. So when those two women come, as if they have a piercing eye, they look at him. They say, John, we are still praying for you. And they go back. Ah! He said he got annoyed many times. Now what do they mean? They are still praying for me as if I may sing that. All this message I gave, you only came and said, we are still praying for you. So, so one day, these two women came again. They said, John, we are still praying for you. We are trusting God to answer our prayer. <laughs> then he, he called them and said, what do you mean? Do you know what they told him? They said, we know you are struggling yet. We see your struggle. We know that there is no breakthrough yet. You are giving us brilliant summons. But we are still praying. When the fire from heaven will fall on your life. <laughs> he said he went back and locked up his house. And said, God. So all these things that I am doing that I thought were not success. He said that was when he received a endowment of power from on earth. And if you are talking of revival that shook the whole of the land. That was when it began. May God deliver you from congregations that are ordinary mediocre, praise singers, financiers without sight. Tell God this afternoon, deliver me from them. Take me from the association of foolish people. Put me in the midst of colleagues and brethren, preachers, who can look at my face and say, brother, 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 something is wrong. Get on your knees. I thought you are interested in being an effective minister. That's why we are sharing this. I just suppose in my heart that there will be some people who want to do better than they are doing now. That's why we are doing all this. Otherwise, shouldn't we have preached ourselves on how to make it, on how to do this? I thought you like to be told the truth. That's why we are sharing this. That's what we saw in the life of John. That's what we saw in the life of Jesus. That's what we saw in the life of Peter. Peter stood up and preached. 3,000 lined up for baptism. No advertisement. As their God changed. Brother, eh? have they got a new Bible that they were reading that got lost? And we are reading a fake Bible? Eh? Is there a new Jesus that walk with them and no more walk with our own? If God is the same, Whatever is wrong, can't we find out? Can we get on our knees this afternoon within the short time we have? Can we tell the truth of our lives? We are all preachers here. We are all leaders here. That's why I'm telling you the whole truth. We are all here. Nobody is looking at another. If you are a pastor and you have to repent, 
Nobody will be embarrassed. God himself will not be embarrassed. God knows that you are looking for reality. Why don't you look for it? Are people already writing you letters? They say, oh, hallelujah. I just like you. And you are so happy to print that in your church magazine. But you never printed the person who wrote you off. Have you been seeing church magazines? Have you ever seen any letter printed among the letters from listeners of somebody who wrote off the pastor? Check it. All the magazines you have in your house. Human beings. Will we pray together this afternoon? Will we go to God who is able to help us? Father! Father, Father, without hypocrisy. Check it. All the magazines you have in your house. Human beings. Will we pray together this afternoon? Will we go to God who is able to help us? Father, Father, without hypocrisy. In the midst of my situation, I have come. Whatever you did to Peter, whatever you did to Paul, whatever you did to John, whatever you did unto your servants of old, do to me. Let us pray. Let us get on our knees. to us kept Lord in thy quiver try three sharpened in thy furnace meet for my master's use now you take your hymn book look at grace thy grace alone while you are on your knees we are praying together we just sing that stanza just uh, one or two times and we shall close this meeting on our knees make me that's four about to us get low in thy quiver try to train sharpened in thy furnace meet for my master's use grace thy grace alone is all i plead for grace to serve the right lord oh grace to love you more stanza four again make me about to ask get lord in thy quiver try to train sharpen in thy furnace meet for my master's use grace your grace alone is all i played for Grace to save a right love. Oh, grace to love you more. Just the chorus one more time. Grace is all I play for. Grace to save a right love. I like love, oh grace, to love you more. Father, we ask you 
not to pass us by. We are before you where we couldn't hide our lives. There's much disparity between us and our elders. Whatever made the word to walk in their mouths and is not working with us, do something about it today in the name of Jesus. Father, we are saying we don't want to take gimmicks, neither do we want the makeshift, we want the reality. When they cried, you intervened. Help us to cry from our souls to you in the reality of our situation that it might please you to respond to our cry. Lord, when men have not seen their problems, they didn't cry. Some of us, we have never cried because we've not seen any problem. But Lord, tonight, to, today, as, as, as you are showing us things, as we lift up our voice unto God who is able to help us, do something in our lives. Do something in our services. Do something in our ministries. Change us. And we shall be changed. Change us. Change us. Even the little Sunday school, the house fellowship we are leading, the small cell meeting we are having, we know we are not effective. We speak, nobody is convicted. Nobody is converted. We have to beg and use apologetics for men to listen to us. Lord, change our situation. Hear our humble cry this afternoon. It has pleased you to put us in leadership. Lord, visit us today. Don't let our lives go like this. Don't let our time proceed like this. Do a new thing among us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are